In this video, we're going to continue with our discussion about how we actually go about doing weighted least squares in practice via feasible GLS. Okay, and just to recap over the steps which we were taking to estimate the weightings which we were going to use in our regression, the first step was that we ran our sort of regression of our dependent variable on our various independent variables. From that, we then got our residual. Then what we did is we run a regression of our log of our residuals on the various independent variables. And then what we did is we got the sort of fitted values for these various deltas on the right hand side. And we used that to get our sort of fitted values of the log of the variance. Or it's sort of, you can sort of think about this GI here or this GI hat as the estimated log of the variance or the conditional variance rather. Okay, so that's where we got up to last time. Now, what we need to do is that, remember that we sort of took the log of the model because we had an exponential model. And to get the variance on its own here, all we need to do then is we just need to take the exponent of gi hat. Because now we're taking the exponent of, let's sort of write it out, we're taking the exponent of the log of ui hat all squared, which is just ui hat all squared, really. So, I mean, you could sort of argue, why don't we just estimate ui hat squared sort of directly using some sort of exponential model? Well, the answer is it's just a little bit more complicated, whereas we can sort of avoid doing maximum likelihood estimation via taking the log of the dependent variable rather than taking the exponent of the independent variables. Okay, so now we've got this hi hat, which is our sort of estimated uh, variance or our estimated conditional variance. How do we then use that to transform our system? Well, the answer is just much like the case where we had sort of, if we had a sort of functional form of the variance, which was the variance of ui given xi was equal to sigma squared times just xi, thinking about just a sort of bivariate case. Then do you remember what we did is we actually divided both sides through by square root of xi. But now we don't actually have this sort of simple form of the variance. But we do have this sort of variance which we've got here given by, or estimated variance which we've got here given by hi hat. So much like the case where we actually knew the variance explicitly, what we do is we divide through by hi, or the square root of hi hat. And we sort of do that to both sides of our sort of initial regression, which is this sort of top thing up here. So we have the regression of yi over the square root of um, hi hat. And then what we do is we divide the, all things on the right hand side by hi hat as well, because whatever we do to the left, we have to do to the right. And then we get a model which looks something like this. And we can sort of think about, it wouldn't be that hard to generalize this, the sort of higher terms of xi. So what are the various properties that feasible generalized least squares have? Because remember we talked about generalized least squares, if we actually know the explicit form of the variance, it turns out that it's blue. But here we don't actually know the variance, so we have to estimate the variance. So what knock-on effect does that have on our estimator? Because it, it can't be blue, right? Because generalized least squares is blue. So which of these elements do you think goes away? Well, it actually turns out that it is no longer unbiased. So that's definitely something which you sort of need to be wary about. So first of all, feasible GLS is actually biased. So that means in a finite sample, the sort of distribution isn't centered around the true population parameters. Okay, so that's something to worry about. But the, this sort of worry goes away if we have a large sample, because it turns out that feasible GLS is asymptotically unbiased. So another word for that is just saying that it is consistent. So that means if we have a big enough sample, we're still going to get estimates of our parameters, which are going to be sort of centered around our, their sort of true population parameters. And finally, why did we do this in the first place? Well, it turns out that if we have a sort of large sample, then, or sort of saying as n goes to infinity, so as n goes to infinity, we actually find that the variance from feasible GLS is less than that from ordinary least squares. So that's a sort of merit for using feasible G GLS over ordinary least squares.